if it goes through a tabo or is in the building, his presence is respectfully requested. Let's give Iggy a hand. He deserves it. He was late. Yeah, thanks, Iggy. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, I couldn't resist it. So, good morning. Welcome to Springwood, everybody. Um, I do admit we've actually had a lot of trouble to get through all the songs in an hour, and we're sort of, we're ready to go, but um, but uh, we certainly want to say that it's not really us, and it's not, we're not here for us, and it's really here for worship. That's what we're all here for. We're here to uh, proclaim our great God and, and give Him worship and praise and honour, and that's really what the job's about. So, if you'd like to stand with us, we're going to sing our first song, Who You Say I Am. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in, oh, his love. Love for me, who the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God, yes, I am. Who am I that the highest king? Would welcome me. I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who oh, the sun sets free. Oh, is free. child of God, yes I am, free at last he has ransomed me, his grace runs deep, while I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me, yes he died. Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God, yes, I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. I am for me, not again. is built on nothing less than Jesus blood and righteousness I 
I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. darkness seems to hide his face. I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. My anchor holds within Dressed in his righteousness alone, Lord, let us stand before the throne. Christ the darkness we were waiting without hope without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the and 
share communion i just want to share a, a verse about the greatness of god it's from isaiah chapter 40 verse 12 who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand or marked off the heavens with a span and closed the dust of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountains in the scales and the hills in a balance this is a, a wonderful verse i think that gives us uh, some perspective on who God is and who we are. Uh, how much water do you reckon I can hold in my hand? I've got a teaspoon here. I tried it last night. Do you reckon about 15 teaspoons? Maybe 10? I tried it and I could fit two teaspoons in my hand. That's all. Yet God created all the water in the whole earth, uh, all 1.3 billion cubic kilometres of it, and it's no problem for him. What sort of distance do you think I could mark out with the span of my hand? Let's measure. So from my pinky to my thumb, it's about 22 centimetres. Not so far. Um, God spoke the heavens into being with his word, and he, he measures them with his hand, a single hand. And even though it's 4.2 light years, it's a long way to the nearest star, he can do it. It's not too hard for him. God's able to weigh the mountains in a scale. So I tried this myself. We had a pile of dirt in the backyard, so I went out this morning, grabbed a big fistful, and I stuck it into this Ziploc bag, and then I weighed it. It has a mass of 218 grams. Not very much. Um, and... There's no Ziploc bag big enough or no scale large enough for even the smallest of the mountains that God's made. So we all come to the communion table with different burdens. Um, some of us are suffering in different ways. It's health issues, addictions, uh, temptations, fears, sin, debt, doubts. Maybe it's a burden for a lost family member, or for a ministry you're involved in, or maybe the, the growing darkness in the, the world around us. I don't want to trivialise these things and uh, pretend that they're small when they're not, and, or that we can you know, easily overcome them when we can't. But what, what I'd like us to do this morning is just have that perspective of what's too big for us is tiny for God. Because our hands are small, but his hands are really, really big. Uh, I'm just going to pray. Lord God, as we come to communion this morning, we, we're reminded by this verse in Isaiah that uh, you are big, you are powerful, you're able to do immeasurably more than we could ask or imagine. And um, Lord, we also know that you're not just powerful, but you're present and you care about us. And you, Lord Jesus, invite us to bring our burdens to you. And you've shown us that you care because the, the hand, same hands that, that made the heavens and the earth and everything in it um, also are the hands that were pierced by nails and hung on a cross for us. And by that, Lord, we know that, that you care about us and you mean it when you ask us to bring all these things to you. So I pray... That would be the thoughts of our heart as we come to the communion table this morning. Um, so let's 
do that now. Uh, we're going to just share in communion in our own time. Um, the band will play a song. Uh, so come to the table. Uh, maybe have a look at your own hands. Just think of how, they, how small they are and those things that you might be trying to hold on to and just you know, in your heart and mind, give it to God whose hands are big. And we'll share communion together. Uh, as part of your worship, uh, you may have brought money along to give us a tithe or offering. There's boxes in the back corners that uh, you can put that in if, if you've come prepared to do that. Uh, so let's, um, let's share together in communion. Thank you. everyone. I think now it's time for children out to one way as we move on to our sermon. Yeah. Thanks, Scott. Yeah, okay. Yeah, thank you, Scott and the team for uh, leading us in worship this morning and uh, communion. The two Scots today. And uh, it really is good to see lots of people here today on a beautiful 
spring morning for, for worship this morning at our 8.30 service. Good to know that there's many people who are also involved uh, online, and so we welcome you to our online service this morning. Whether you're watching it live or also many people watching a bit later on as you tune in to a worship experience uh, from the comfort of your home, from the safety of your home wherever you are in Australia or even internationally as you are watching today. Uh, members here might not realise that there are some people who regularly uh, do tune into our service from America and from Vanuatu and from Melbourne and uh, different parts of, of the country. So yeah, really good to see you guys today. There's lots of things happening around the place. Yes, the kids' program's on today, but there's some good news too. And in fact, uh, I do understand, I did hear from a little bird this morning that um, Charlie and Sarah announced their engagement yesterday. So why don't we congratulate Sarah on that good news today as they plan a whole new uh, phase of life in the, uh, the years that, that lie ahead. And we pray God's blessing upon you guys. Also should mention to the church and online too that uh, our, we have two new elders. We mentioned this at the AGM but hadn't sort of said anything in church. And Scott, our worship leader today in his Batman shirt, is one of our elders at the church as is Tim Cole. So let's congratulate Tim and uh, S Scott on being elders and really thank them for, for taking on this role. We have five uh, elders who serve with me on the church board uh, just to give that oversight and governance in the life of the church. And uh, ah, I should also mention there is a creche available over here if you need a creche. There's no morning tea this morning for those of you who are here. Uh, we might get back to that at some point, but right now, we're still having a bit of a breather from that because there's rules about how we have to serve morning tea. You have to be at tables and all that sort of thing. And uh, we'll see what happens next. And just remember the whole social distancing. It's easy to forget up here in Queensland that there are still social distancing rules. We're still able to run this church service here at the church twice on Sunday because we have a COVID safe plan. And the COVID safe plan says 1.5 meter social distancing, separate exits and entrances, extra cleaning, uh, no handshakes and hugs and kisses, all those sort of things, just to keep uh, doing the right thing to uh, ensure that the, uh, the disease doesn't spread any further in Queensland. But I'm just excited that we've had a whole term now of being able to meet together back at church after four months without services. And uh, whilst I know there are people watching online who are in places where you can't go to your church, uh, because there's been shutdowns uh, for Victoria and other places overseas as well. We've been very fortunate now since July 12th. So it's pretty, I think it's our ninth week back in, in uh, worship services again. All right, now the big announcement for me this morning to mention is that next Sunday we're doing our service a little differently. It's just got to be the same si service, same time. We'll still have communion, we'll still have a message, we'll still have singing. But it's Bell and Phil featuring as our leaders next Sunday. So Belle Thompson, one of our own girls here from Springwood, who is, you know her well, those of you who've been here a while, a uh, singer-songwriter, and Belle and Phil do two of the country, uh, singing and sharing and preaching and visiting different churches, and uh, they're going to be leading the service next week. So Belle will be leading in music and singing and stories. Phil will be bringing a message and leading around communion. So don't miss it. It's going to be something different. It, uh, we won't have the big band, but we'll have, uh, we'll have Belle leading, Phil bringing a message. Phil's the uh, executive officer for the Global Leadership Network of Australia as well. So both have a lot to share, a lot to say, have a lovely faith. So don't miss next Sunday, 20th of September, our special event Sunday with Belle and Phil Thompson, and uh, both 8.30 and 10 a.m. And we're also doing a 6 p.m. service next Sunday night with an unplugged praise and worship and testimony night. We'd love you to come back for 6 p.m. And uh, that, that's uh, going to be on next Sunday night as well. All right, would you join me in just a moment of prayer before we get into God's Word this morning? Well, Lord God, Lord God first of all, we, we come and we, we continue to give you thanks and praise. We've sung the songs praising and honoring and lifting up Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, but we do it again in prayer now and say, thank you, Lord God, for giving us Jesus, who came into this world, who's come into our lives, who brings change and transformation and hope and life. 
Thank you, Lord God, for all that you have given us through Christ. Every spiritual blessing under the heavenly realms. Lord, thank you for this new day, for each day has its new mercies. But Lord, we're also coming to you in this moment with prayers. We pray, Lord, for those in our own fellowship who are finding life difficult at the moment, for those who are in hospital, for those who are not well, for those who are isolated. We pray for those around the country who are in different stages of, of shutdown or who might be isolated and hospitalized, even without being able to have their family come and visit. Lord, bless these people. Pray for those who are sick. Lord, we pray again for our governments that you'd give guidance and leadership to them as they lead, that they would be looking to you for wisdom, for our prime minister, our premier, all of our state premiers, for all of those in governments and health departments. Lord, we pray for the leaders in our land. And Lord, we pray, Lord, that as a church, we here at Springwood and around this community would be faithful in sharing a message of good news and hope to a world that needs to hear it and a world that needs to see it in action. So Lord, might we live lives, speak words and share the message that gives hope and life to the people around and about us. Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, a dear, gentle old man was standing at the pearly gates of heaven, standing, waiting, and St. Peter came along and asked him a few questions. He asked the man about his beliefs, and then he also asked the man about any good deeds that he had done. Well, the man pondered for a moment and said, Oh, yes, there was this one time when I pulled into a petrol station, and as I was filling up my car, I noticed there was a man harassing a young woman who was also at the petrol station. Oh, he was a big man, 1.8 meters in every direction, and a Hell's Angels bikey. I don't know where I got the courage, but I immediately plucked up the courage and I went to the rescue of this damsel in distress. I walked over to that bikey. I pushed over his shiny Harley Davidson motorbike. I kicked in the spokes. Then I grabbed this guy by the scruff of the neck and told him to stop harassing this woman and to get lost. Well, St. Peter was fairly impressed with this dear old man's story of heroism. And he said to the man, he said, oh, wow, this, that's an amazing story. He said, when did this happen? The guy said, oh, about five minutes ago. <laughs> Many people in our society today are willing and able to do good deeds. There are many good citizens in our neighbourhoods, here at Springwood and I think even at Daisy Hill where we've just settled in. There's some good neighbours, some good people, some decent citizens. But of course in our world today and in our society today and in our own region, in the Logan area or in Brisbane or in Australia or in Western countries or anywhere around the world, there are also many, many examples of very bad citizens, very poor citizens, of those who are not being good citizens at all. There are many who would disrespect the government, disrespect their council, who would show disrespect to the police in their words and in their actions, complete disobedience to government um, authority. We've seen images on our TV screens this year of people in the name of protest uh, going too far rather than just bringing a voice and a word, violently looting, burning down buildings. There's been lawlessness and anarchy. There are people who, uh, who just uh, want to bring destruction on society because they disagree with something or because they are upset about something. We see a lot of anger in our world today that bubbles over in all sorts of ungodly and lawless attitudes. We see domestic violence on the rise. We see alcoholism on the rise. We see trolling and discourteous behavior online. In fact, it's one of the places we see poor citizenship most boldly. We see people calling each other awful names online under anonymous personas. 
And even when they're not anonymous, because they're sort of behind a screen a long way away, when they see someone that says something they disagree with, oh, they come, the typing comes out and disrespectful and hurtful things are said and people are put down and people are called names and there's a lot of discourteous and even um, abusive behaviour that happens online. And of course there are selfish attitudes that we see all around us. You could fill in the blanks, you could go on and on. The things we see in the world today in a society around us, whether it's in our neighbourhoods, whether it's in, in, in our, our nation or whether it's sometimes what we see overseas, uh, on the news, just examples of poor citizenship, of being bad citizens. And our message today is really going to be about being good citizens, about being good citizens. And I think I've got a scripture here from Philippians chapter 1 and verse... Uh, oh, I've got the flicker. Hang on, here I am waiting for someone else to do it for me. <laughs> here we go. Ba-boom. Be good citizens. And so we read in Philippians 1 and verse 27 from the International Standard, the only thing that matters in the end is that you continue to live as good citizens in a manner worthy of the gospel. And in many of the letters of Paul and of Peter to the early church, there are instructions about how to live with um, authority, how to live in society today, even in societies that might be anti-Christian, that might be oppressive, that might disagree with what you believe, live in those societies as good citizens in a manner that is worthy of the gospel. But we're actually going to turn our minds to Titus in chapter 3. I want to read the scriptures first, and then, uh, then we'll go back and look at some of the key thoughts. But how, how can we be good citizens, and why, does it, why is it important that Christians today, as we read a read here in Titus 3, verses 1 uh, onwards, uh, that we be good citizens, that we sort of set the tone, set an example. Well, let's read from, uh, from the Scriptures. Titus chapter 3. Remind them, now, put it in context, Paul, the Apostle, is writing to Titus, a young minister, a young leader on the island of Crete, and so he's telling Titus what to teach, what to tell the people in Crete as he sets up churches, as he gets established. So Paul says to Titus, remind the people to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy toward, toward all people. That's sort of a key couple of verses for our message today. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Saviour appeared, He saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Saviour, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. Another key about this good citizens. These things are excellent and profitable for people. Okay, that's a good word. We've been working our way for those of you who have just joined us today or visiting today online or live here at Springwood. We've been working our way through the letter from Paul to Titus. This is week number five. And uh, we're in Titus chapter 3. And uh, it reminded me, as, as Jeff gave some introductions to his recent sermons from chapter 2, he shared a little of the history and culture of, of, uh, of Crete. And uh, here's a, a map on the screens of where Crete sits. It sort of sits, it's a Greek island, not too far from Turkey as well. You'll see the island of Rhodes there and uh, Crete. And then you, above the island of Crete, you'll see 
the nation of Greece. And this is where the letter is written to. And in fact, it reminded me, as Jeff showed all these pictures, that Wendy and I actually on our little dinghy went and visited some of these Greek islands about five years ago on some long service leave. In fact, we, this was our unofficial follow the footsteps of Paul tour. And uh, we got to see a whole lot of wonderful places that were New Testament sites. We visited Ephesus and Corinth and Rome and Athens and Crete. We went to this island of Crete where, we, uh, uh, where, where, where the New Testament is written in these nations, in these places, as the gospel spread from Jerusalem and then into Samaria and then as it grew into, into you know, uh, Asia Minor, now Turkey, and then Greece and then Rome and Macedonia and right through Europe as Christianity spread in those early years of the growth of the church, we were able to visit many of those places and it was a wonderful trip. And so here we are at, uh, on the island of Crete at the, the palace of Knossos or Knossos which was the home of the Minoan Empire uh, from like the 3000 BC through to about 1100 BC before the, um, the community uh, started. So this is, these are archaeological digs. These have been rebuilt, some of these places, based on the archaeology that they have found. And uh, this, so this, is, this is part of the island of Crete where this was written to. And uh, a bit more of the, the archaeological find on the Isle of the Palace of Knossos, which was the Minoan Empire on the Greek island of Crete. Um, in Heraklion, which is the name of the city where we were visiting on the, that day, there is a, this is a church that is honoured in the honour of Saint Titus or Saint Titos, I think they call him, and uh, Saint Titus among the Greek Orthodox Christians of. Crete, as you would imagine, is a really revered leader because he, you know, he helped establish the church right there in the, uh, the nation of Crete, that, that Greek island. But we come back to our key verse. And we're going we're to unpack this today and be really practical in our application. And what does this say to me? How am I to live? Because so much of Titus is about how we live, how we exist as a local church. We'll get back to a little bit of that next Sunday. But also how we to live our lives as families, as husbands and wives, as employees and employers, and as citizens in uh, the nations in which we live. Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, avoid quarreling, be gentle, and show perfect courtesy toward all people. So let's begin right at the top. I think the first lesson that we can learn about how to be good citizens is that we are to respect civic and governmental authority. Uh, it's pretty clear in our Bible reading there to be submissive to rulers and to be obedient uh, there in verse 1. The message paraphrases it a little bit, respect the government and be law-abiding. I mean, these are pretty much basic sort of stuff. Most of us would think, hey, if you want to be a decent person, let alone a Christian leader or a Christian person, you know, you've got to, you've got to get these things right. Respect the government. But we need to look at a bit of history and a bit of context. And as we've been working through Titus, uh, we have already had a few comments uh, from Jeff's messages and, and my earlier messages about the fact that the people of Crete were known to be pretty violent and aggressive sort of people. There was also a lot of immorality in the community in the, at the time uh, that the church was being established there. The Cretans were known to be not notoriously turbulent and quarrelsome and impatient with authority. Polybius, the Greek historian, said, historian said of them that they were constantly involved in insurrections, murders and wars. In fact, in chapter 1 and verse 12 of Titus, of this letter itself, we read that Crete's own prophets have said, Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, lazy gluttons. And then uh, Paul goes on to say, this saying is true, therefore, you know, teach them, teach them well, so that the Christians will be different from the society in which they live. They will stand out they will be well discipled and they will be different to the world in which they live. But you know, it's not only true of the people of the historic 
Cretan community. We see a lot, as we said before, we see a lot of distrust of authority. We see a lot of um, self-willed, uh, anti-authority attitudes in society today. Living in this sort of "I did it my way" kind of world. And you know, the, but the scriptures are pretty clear about the sort of manner that believers are to live in relation to governments and authorities. Um, For example, we are urged to include our leaders, um, kings and emperors in previous eras, although we still have a queen to pray for in our nation. We're not a republic at this point in in time. We are called to pray for kings, queens, leaders, politicians, those in authority. 1 Timothy 2, um, we read these words, I urge you, in fact, uh, Paul writes to Timothy, similar to his writing to Titus in Crete, he's writing to Timothy in Ephesus, and he says to, to pray for people, just pray for all sorts of people, all the time, in all sorts of prayers, intercede on their behalf and give thanks for, pr- for them. And then he says in verse 2, and quite specific, pray this way for kings and all who are in authority, so that we can live peaceful and quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity. This is good, and it pleases God our Saviour. So we're to include our politicians, councils, governments, premiers, prime ministers in our prayers. And it's good for us to remember not only to pray for the leaders that we like, or the ones that we voted for, but also to pray for the people who are in the party that maybe we didn't vote for, because they need our prayers and our support as well. We are called to pray to, to, and to be submissive, to be subject to governing authorities. Um, I can have another passage, Romans chapter 13. There's quite a long passage in Romans chapter 13 that deals with this issue. When you've got Christians, many of whom had come out of uh, Judaism, but then there were lots of new believers as well from pagan religions, Roman citizens and the like, And so in Romans, we're reading, how do you deal with this issue of, you're a Christian, but your your governing authorities have different beliefs. Uh, They they might not always be, um, they might not always be godly in the way that they conduct themselves or in the things that they say. And yet we still read these words, Romans 13, let everyone be subject to governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Verse 2, consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment upon themselves. It goes on for quite a few more verses. And then in verse 5, it says, Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but as a matter of conscience. And even goes on to talk about paying your taxes doing the right thing in all of that way as well and to show respect and honour where it is due. And so, you know, the, the, the instructions in Scripture, right, particularly in the letters of the New Testament, are quite clear to Christians living in a world where not everybody shares our faith, shares our belief. Remember, the New Testament wasn't written to a Christianized world. It was written into a world where the Christianity was blooming and blossoming and growing, but it was still small and it was still beginning in a predominantly pagan and uh, a, a world where many other religions were evidenced. Just like the world today, really, when you, you think about it. But of course, being submissive to authority doesn't mean that we bow to tyranny or that we allow uh, abuse and ungodly things to happen. In fact, uh, there are times when, as Christians, we have to take a stand. But when we take a stand, we take a stand in a godly way. Being subject to authorities in our society today does not mean that we have to agree with the authorities on everything. We have a democratic society. We have an opportunity to participate in our society. So I would go along from this passage, I would go on to say that we live in a a participatory democracy where we should get involved, vote, 
have a voice, write a letter to your member of parliament, stay up to date with what's happening in the world and in society at large. For some, even stand for office. Try to be a good influence in society, whether it be at the council or in some other area or in government, whatever. We admire those who Christians who are willing to take a stand and to be a voice for godly standards and beliefs in the world today. It's not always easy for them. They often get trolled. They often get howled, howled down. Let's pray for them too. So yes, being subject to authority doesn't mean we always agree with authority. We might not agree with every, every rule, every law, every decision that comes from our governments. As Christians, there are things that we probably are not going to agree with. And yet we can be subject to authority in the context of this and still behave in a godly manner even when we disagree with what's happening in society at large. There are ways that we can express our disdain for a policy or uh, whatever without having to go into violence and uh, abuse and name calling and slander we can argue the points can't we and i admire those who do take a stand for christ and christian values in the public square as uh, we're all called to do in fact there are even those situations where as believers we have to take a stand and so you look at all scripture you look at the context of all scripture and we've got the example of peter and the apostles when they were told not to preach they were told not to tell people about Jesus right in the early beginnings of the church, Acts chapter 5. And we've got them there hauled before the, the, the authorities. And they say this, they say, we must obey God rather than men. And they were clear about where their ultimate allegiance would be. You see, yes, we are to be good citizens here on earth, but what else are we? We are citizens of where? We are citizens of heaven. We are citizens in the city of God, but we are called as citizens in, in God's kingdom to live in a manner worthy of the gospel of God's kingdom right here, right now, in the real world, in this moment in history, wherever it is that we live. I mean, there are Christians who stood against Hitler's treatment of the Jews and of minorities, who were martyred because they took a stand against Hitler and his government, while other people, and even other good people, let things slip by. So there are times when we have to take a stand. All right, well, we've got to keep moving along, because if we're to be really good citizens, we, uh, we also read here that we are to you know, respect our government and our police authorities, rather than have a disdain for them, rather than to be aggressive toward them, rather than to name, call, and slander, and all that. But then we are to serve in our local community. I like what uh, we read there in Titus chapter 3 and verse 1. It says about, yeah, okay, um, you know, submitting to authorities. But then it says, be ready for every good work. Be ready for every good work. Always be ready to lend a helping hand, we read. Or to be ready to do something helpful in the contemporary English version. And so it's not just that we are sort of on a, on a passive level submitting to the rules and the, of society that we live in, but we're actually doing something proactive on the front foot. We're on the back foot. Yes, we're doing the right thing. We're paying our taxes. We're mowing our lawn. We're keeping, you know, we're doing the right thing in the society so that we're, we're living a good moral life. But um, we're also doing something positive to make a positive, proactive difference by serving and being ready to lend a helping hand and do something good in society. Um, we, we read similar words in, in 1 Peter 2 and verse 12. And here we know that the Christians in 1 Peter, and this is written to the area that's now Turkey, was uh, Asia Minor, and um, we know that people, the Christians were being persecuted in that part of the world. And we know that from the context, from the actual words that we read in 1 Peter, in the letter of 1 Peter. But in 1 Peter 2 it says, Live such good lives, got to remember the clicker, among non-believers, 
among the pagans, actually, literally, or the Gentiles, that live such good lives that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your what? Your good deeds and glorify God your Father. So we're to live good lives and we're to do good deeds. We're to be, you know, subject to authorities, law-abiding citizens, but also doing good in the community, amongst our neighbours, wherever it would be, because this is going to help people see the goodness of God. Jesus said something similar, and we know these words. Jesus said, let your light shine before men. Let your light shine. Don't hide it under a bushel. No, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, we used to sing in Sunday school. This little light of mine, we're going to let it shine. Don't just pull back, you know, keep our nose clean, mind our own business, subject to authorities. No, let's take another step forward and be positive, letting our light shine before men through our words and through our deeds and through our organized activities, but also individually in the activities that we would go about in our world uh, today, you see, when, we, uh, when people see our good deeds, it may lead them to glorify God, our Father, who is in heaven. There can be lots of examples, I'm sure, that you could give about how to get in and serve your local community. You know, it's good that we serve in the life of the church. It's good that people who are members of a local church get involved and find a place to serve, use their spiritual gift to edify others. But it is also important that we have something in reserve <laughs> as we live our lives, that we're not so bound up doing church stuff that we haven't got the opportunity to reach out to the community around us. Now, that, that instructs our church leaders to make sure that our church programs are also open for those people to come in, for us to invite people in, to help people of all different backgrounds and as they're on a journey toward faith, but also in our own lives to get involved and to serve our local community. Um, it could be as simple as uh, my wife yesterday making brownies and putting them in little containers and a little uh, greeting on them and taking them to our neighbours because we've just moved into a new neighbourhood. And, and, and people are hey, reserved about jumping in to meet the new neighbours, so we'll, we'll get on the front foot and we'll, we'll go and meet the neighbours. And we went around to some of the local neighbours, even got invited in for a cup of tea and just a little gift, just to try to build a bridge, just to try to do good in community, to do something that to bless others. But it could also be there are people in the church here who are involved in activities and ministries that reach marginalized people in our community. Those who are involved in uh, the Kairos prison ministries, who, when the prisons aren't shut down, are able to go in and help to run programs to bring uh, healing and hope and transformation in the, the inner worlds of those who are incarcerated or their families through Kairos Prison Ministry. There are those who might get involved in helping with the homeless. Ministries like Celebrate Recovery are great for Christian people here in the church, but they're also open to our community as a place where people can find hope and healing from some of the hurts and struggles and habits of life. We get involved in schools, and as a church here, we get involved in a, a building blocks program that through the EDGE ministry and with Chris and the PAYS team, go into local schools and get alongside some of the kids that need a bit of an extra help, an extra helping hand, and serve alongside them. In our old church, we, we, um, there were lots of, uh, lots of non-church people involved in youth and kids ministries, but then we, the church started to teach English to refugees, migrants, and uni students who had come. And it became a really big ministry. And we saw as we began to uh, tackle that ministry, and I don't take the credit for it because there were others in the church who were leading that ministry and doing a wonderful job, uh, we saw the church become uh, more and more multicultural as people from different backgrounds and cultures felt, felt that this church was a place of welcome. They could come and learn English. Someone would get alongside them. People from Africa and the Middle East and, and Southeast Asia and wherever it was where they would live. But by doing good, serving in the community as individuals or as a local church, it, glor it can lead people to glorify God in heaven. So be good citizens. 
Be good citizens by respecting authority. Be good citizens by serving in the local community. But then fourthly, and this I guess can touch, touches us all at a, a bit more of a personal level, there are four clear instructions listed in verse 2 about how we are to be considerate of others. That's one of the things I think we don't see enough of in wider society today. It's just that general courtesy that we would have toward one another. Remind them to speak evil of no one, avoid quarreling, be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy toward all people. Let's just run through them. Do unto others, Jesus said, as you would have them do to you. The golden rule, as it is sometimes called. So, speak evil of no one. This is about slander. These are about the words that we use. In the message, it simply says, no insults, name-calling. When we revert to insults and name-calling in a debate, we're really going to the lowest level. We're not debating the issue anymore. We're attacking the person. And we're doing so by slandering them. Jesus had strong words to say about slander. He said, if you, know, you call people names, you're sort of murdering them in their heart. You're assassinating their character. And sometimes in the world today, people have their, assassin their character assassinated and because they're not even in earshot, they haven't even got a, a response. They can't even give a reply because that's, that's slander when it's spoken to a person, when it's spoken about a person, to somebody else. It also is gossip. Don't say cruel things. The Greek word here is blasphemio. We know what comes from that word, don't we? To blaspheme, to defame, vilify, to speak evil of. And yet, it is common. This is really common in politics and in business, and even in online uh, arguments, etc. And then to avoid quarrelling. We're going to talk more about that next week for a local church, to avoid, as best you can, unnecessary quarrels. To keep the main thing the main thing. But in the wider world, as we are trying to show, as good citizens, to live a life worthy of the gospel, that we wouldn't be brawlers, in the King James Version it says. In the message, no fights. And the word here, amakos, is to be peaceful. It's the opposite of being in battle mode. It's to be tolerant and, and, and peaceable in the way that we deal with people who are different. Then be gentle. Well, that sort of speaks for itself, doesn't it? Don't be aggressive. Don't be overbearing, harsh. It's to be gentle in our manner, in our speech. Strong on what we believe and on where we stand, but gentle in the way that we deal with people, even who disagree. And finally, to show perfect courtesy toward all people. This can be sometimes translated humility, meekness. It's one whose temper is under complete control. To show that courtesy, perfect courtesy toward all people. Well, time's up. And we're going to finish our service with a song in a moment. But the final point is, the band come up, the final uh, point here that we have in, in uh, Titus chapter 3 is to, yes, be a good citizen, but do all of this as a response to the gospel. So it's not like we're trying to be good citizens to earn ourselves brownie points for heaven. No, we do good deeds in the community. We live peaceable lives in society today because of what God has done for us. It's our response to the gospel. Because Paul writes to Timothy and said, we too were once disobedient and foolish. We were once slaves to lusts and pleasures. We were once misled. Our, our lives were full of evil. But then God, our Savior, revealed his kindness and love and he saved us. And he filled us with his spirit, in verse 6. And by his grace, he made us right with God in his sight and gave us confidence that we will have eternal life. We have a whole new foundation for living, the spirit of God within, the grace that makes us right with God, a whole new foundation, a, a future hope assured. But then he says, so respect authority. Do good. Be considerate. And you will be good citizens reflecting the goodness of God, worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ and making a difference in the world. Would you stand as I pray and then we'll sing together.
Let's stand. Lord God, we do stand here in this place of worship and we ask for your help, for your encouragement and your guidance that we would live lives that truly are worthy of the gospel that we are called to live. Lord, give us courage to do what is right. Help us to be submissive, which goes against the grain of so much in our society. To be submissive, first of all, to you and to your spirit. But then also to be subject to God-given authority in our land and in our homes and in our church that we would truly reflect the nature of Jesus Christ to himself whilst God himself was subject to his Father and his authority. Lord, help us to do good. Inspire us. Fill us with dreams and ideas of how we can make a difference in our society, in our community, that we together as a local church and individually as believers would do good and make a difference and help people and show the love of Christ in real and practical ways. And finally, Lord, help us to be considerate to one another here and in our neighborhoods, our workplaces, wherever we would be. We pray, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.
us. Be- beautiful words to finish the service with, and thanks, Dale, for that message. And I pray that the Lord would go with you as you leave this place and that he would grow the seed that he's planted in you today. Thank you very much.